Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the WellBe podcast. I am thrilled to introduce you to today's guest, Rosalie de la Foré, who is a registered herbalist and the author of two best selling books on herbs Alchemy of Herbs and Wild Remedies. Rosalie, thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me, Adrian. Yes, this is a topic I've long wanted to cover and having a registered herbalist to explain it all will be so helpful for me and my whole community. So first, what or who first sparked your passion for herbs and natural medicine? Yeah, that's a great question. One that I ask myself a lot because I can see all these like different paths that, you know, kind of brought me to where I am today. And, um, you know, one thing I remember is being like maybe around 10 years old and I went on a hike, like a guided hike. And, um, the guide was talking about, you know, the geological formations of the hike, all that kind of stuff. And he showed us this plant and told us that it was used for tea and invited us to just like take off a bit of that plant and taste it. And I remember that just like blew my mind. I just like, couldn't believe it, which is kind of you know, a a sign of how disconnected I was from nature at that age. But just the idea that you could like walk along a trail and take a plant and eat it or use it for tea was just like, wow, I just thought it was so cool. And for years, I remember like, I'd see that plant with friends and I'd be like all knowing, you know, like, let me tell you (laughs) about this plant. (laughs) So I definitely felt that, you know, pulling me from a very young age. And as a teenager, I loved natural health. I was a super nerd. Like I got my driver's license. And I remember one of my first thoughts being like, now I can drive myself to the health food store. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's just been like, you know, woven throughout. And um, it was always just, you know, like as long as I remember, just an interest and kind of hobby, I guess. And then in my early 20s, I got really ill with a rare autoimmune disease. And it was like through that process of healing and turning to herbs for healing that I just had this huge paradigm shift of how powerful herbs and holistic health can be. Yeah, of course. I think like many of us, there's some sort of health issue that makes you realize you could be doing things differently or harnessing the power of different healing modalities. And then most of us are so amazed at what we were able to accomplish with that healing or upset by what happened before that happened, that Mm -hmm. it inspires us to make a career change. That's certainly what happened to me. And it sounds like it fueled your desire to go into herbalism. And I know that's a theme that I've heard through many of the experts that have been on the Wellbe show and podcasts. All right. So what did you do when you had this rare autoimmune disease and how did herbs actually help you? I had this like crazy set of symptoms. I had this uh, high fever at night that would disappear in the daytime. And I had severe aches and pains in my joints. And I was, you know, just didn't really get out of bed for weeks. And then I eventually landed in the hospital and uh, took some time there and a whole team of specialists. And then I was told, you know, I have this rare autoimmune disease called Stills disease. And I did not have a good prognosis. They told me, that they could give me um, prednisone or steroids for now, but that they wouldn't work in time and that I could expect to have a declining quality of life until life expectancy around age 40. And that was it. I mean, they gave me a brochure. They literally gave me a brochure and was like, good luck. (laughs) So, which, you know, like looking back on it, I'm kind of glad that that's how it went down because it was kind of like Western medicine just like shut the door in my face and was just like, nope, can't help you you know, there's no cure for this. Good luck. And so I pretty immediately, you know, pivoted and started seeing all sorts of um, holistic practitioners, acupuncture, herbalists, naturopaths, and, you know, began working on, you know, looking at my diet at the time, you know, I've always been interested in natural health. So at the time I was eating a so-called healthy diet it was all organic and consisting mainly of like soy and wheat, really, <laughs> I was, you know, young twenties. So I just was like doing the best I could, but it wasn't, you know, really great. So I reinvented my diet and, um, then I took a lot of herbs and that was really, you know, I took a lot of Chinese herbs at the time and within six months, I, I didn't have symptoms anymore. And so that was really, you know, again, that like paradigm shift because Western medicine had just been like, you know, sorry, here's some steroids. It's going to suck from here on out for you. And when I went and saw all these practitioners, they were just like, oh yeah, you know, let's look, let's work with you and let's get you better. And they did. And so I was just like, wow. 
you know, like supposedly this like alternative health is like quackery. <laughs> That's, you know, not really like for serious issues, but that definitely changed my mind about that. So um, that uh, just completely changed my whole life. And I knew that I wanted to sink further into that from my own learning and be able to help others as well. Amazing. That is a lot more than just you had a rare autoimmune disease. That's very serious. So that's pretty, it's very impressive what you were able to accomplish with that healing. So there are a lot of myths about herbal medicine. And I think, you know, if you don't have knowledge about herbs or herbal medicine, you're thinking right now that maybe herbs are just basil, cilantro, mint, right? Or something that Chinese people have used for many years with things like, you know, tiger balm, or they make uh, some teas with herbs and things like that. But in fact, there's much more to it. So would you mind explaining some of the myths you've heard over the years about herbal medicine? And can you debunk any of them for us? Sure. I like the way you frame that question, um, because that is kind of some, simpl I think, common simplistic views of herbs. And I would say there's herbs and there's herbalism or herbal medicine. And in some ways, I think people sometimes confuse herbs for herbal medicine, which by that, I mean, with herbal medicine, it's a whole system of healing. And so it's not simply about saying like, oh, you know, I'm currently taking this pharmaceutical drug. I don't want to take it anymore. So I'm going to take herbs because they're natural and then like substituting the two. That's, you know, that's using herbs, but that's not using herbal medicine. And so I think that's something that often gets like lost in the, you know, learning of things is that you can just like take herbs without really understanding kind of this deeper way or method of approaching herbs, using herbs, prescribing herbs, we could say. So that's kind of a big myth, I think. Um, I know a lot of people, like probably like myself, you know, get started by like, wondering, you know, like what herb is good for eczema? What herb is good for insomnia? Whatever, you know, fill in the blank issue. And then think that like, you just get like a, you know, like, oh, take this herb. And sometimes that works, honestly, you know, like sometimes you can get that slam dunk kind of thing, but more often than not, it's a little bit more complex than that because it isn't just substituting herbs for drugs. So I think that's a big myth out there. And one that's harmful because I think people might be interested in herbs and then they, you know, they do try that herb for eczema or whatever the thing is, and it doesn't work the way they wanted it to. And then it's kind of like, oh, herbs don't work, you know, cause it wasn't, but yeah, it's a, a big difference between just like taking a, this for that situation versus really using herbal medicine within a greater context. Another myth that I think is common is one way I think in which Western researchers or medicine approaches herbs is they want to know what are the bioavailable constituents or what are like the most active constituents within an herb. And so they want to really, you know, they approach it in a reductionist way. They want to just use those constituents. And there's a lot of, you know, pros and cons, I guess you could say behind that or just reasonings, but in herbalism, we you know, value and know that it's not just these individual constituents within an herb that are valuable, but really the whole herb and the whole experience around that herb too. So that's another thing that, um, you know, people might say, you know, that they want to just use standardized extracts, but, you know, we're really missing out on a lot if we aren't working with whole herbs and our simple yeah. herbs. I, I've heard that a few times. I don't know a lot about herbs, but the knowledge I do have, I've oh, it's always stuck with me that, you know, the pharmaceutical world or the, the Western medicine world, they like to take out the chemical or the, the extract or extract whatever it is that they've been able to isolate as the thing that's, you know, most effective. But what they don't realize is that nature is a beautiful harmony of things and that there's a reason for everything. Right. And so uh, a lot of times that isolate or that extract needs the other parts of that plant. Maybe it's the fiber, maybe, you know, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, and nature has thought about it. They've had thousands and thousands of years to think about it and get it just right. And so that's also the whole idea, right, between eating like a whole food is that, you know, 
the sugar of a fruit can be more damaging if not consumed with the fiber to slow it down and help with blood sugar regulation, all of that. So um, I think people forget that that's the same thing with herbs and that just because you were able to identify or isolate some part of it that's very healing doesn't mean you should take it out. Like maybe there's a reason it's coming in the whole form that it's in. So I love that you mentioned that because that's one of the few things I know and think is cool. I want to, I want to trust that nature knows what it's doing um, and not, you know, mess with it. Yeah. I like that comparison between food. Cause I think that's something that people can relate to, you know, we know that like just juicing something and missing out on all those other nutrients within the plant is not necessarily helpful, like you said, and this, you know, same thing goes for plants. And we, you know, we see science catching up with that. Like, for example, there's a lot of talk about antioxidants and, you know, antioxidant this and, you know, addressing inflammation. And so they've tried to create like the antioxidant pill and then studies are showing like that actually doesn't work. Uh, but what does work is eating whole foods and whole herbs, um, because there is so much going on, you know, not just these like simple antioxidants. Yeah. So I think that people who are familiar with herbs or who already use herbs understand generally, you know, where to start if they had an ailment or they wanted to go further down a path using herbs. But most people, I think, think it's completely off limits, right? Mentally, um, they might have a CVS or a Walgreens and that's primarily where they would go get something if there was an ailment. Maybe they have a Whole Foods or a health food store and they might go to that section of sort of medicinal things if they were having a stomach ache or a headache or something, if they didn't want to go to a drugstore and look for something there. But I think it's still very unclear to the majority of people is that herbal if, you know, is that herbal medicine if I get it at a health food store or do I need to go to like an actual herbalist who's, you know, grinding the herbs up and putting them in capsule form and things like that. So would you just kind of, you know, treat us, treat us like children <laughs> and walk us through, you know, herbalism from the stuff you might find at a health food store or, you know, uh, uh, in that sort of, you know, medicinal section to the kind of herbalism I'm talking about with the the grinding up and what do you use for what? And what are these different kinds of, th- you know, walk us through it. Okay. <laughs> well, when, as you were speaking, I thought, you know, some of our, the best herbal medicine is actually found in the produce section oh. of a supermarket. So things like ginger and garlic and mint, those are all really, you know, powerful herbal medicines that are very accessible to folks and can be found in most grocery stores. So definitely that's herbal medicine and going to like the herbal section of a health food store, you might find bulk herbs, uh, you know, which you can just buy, you know, like a couple spoonfuls of chamomile or, you know, something like that. Or, you know, there's, there's a lot of teas already in tea bags. All of that is herbal medicine. The difference then when you see a practitioner is that they might be creating customized formulas for a person. So that is a big part of herbalism is figuring out, you know, like looking at classic formulas and then adjusting them for the person that's actually sitting in front of you. And some people wildcraft their herbs, some people, you know, get them from specific suppliers. Uh, So there's a lot of different ways we can source herbal medicine too. Herbs are plants that have medicinal properties and they range from things that you can just add to food like basil and herbs and mint and things like that, um, which can be very helpful and garlic and ginger and whatever to plants that maybe you wouldn't necessarily eat in food, but that are very, very medicinal and that you might uh, take in like a tea form or capsule form. Mm -hmm. Is that about right? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's or use in some sort of like topical salve if it was a burn or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I'll come across people, especially like gardeners or somebody who thinks like herbs to have like a very defined definition, like they are herbaceous plants that, you know, die back every year. That's kind of one definition of herbs, but in the like herbal medicine world, we call everything an herb, whether it's like cinnamon, which is a bark. And we, we sometimes even call medicinal mushrooms an herb. So it's pretty, it's kind of like natural medicinal substance. We could go under the herb. So yeah, like you said, everything from garlic to even special preparations like um, alcohol extracts or tinctures 
um, all of that being herbal medicine. Got it. Okay. So if somebody was listening to this and saying, I've been relying far too long on, you know, Advil or this other thing for headaches or period cramps or whatever. And I'd really like to clean all that out and get some herbal remedies for these things. Um, but they have no idea. Should I be taking it in capsule form in tea form? Should I be trying to eat it? Where would I go? Where would you start? You know? Yeah, there is so much to learn about herbs. Um, like you said, not just like what to take, but how to take it and for how long and, and on and on and on. So if somebody is at that like very beginning stage, but they know that they want to start looking at herbal medicine to address some of their existing issues or, you know, to maintain health, I think working with a practitioner is going to be your best first step. Uh, because that, you know, when you work with someone experienced, they can help you with all of those things of figuring out what are the herbs that are for you. Because as we've talked, there's not just like the herb for eczema, right? We're looking at people um, and what might be the best herb for them. And then also helping with all of those things, like how do you formulate those herbs? How much do you take for how long? Um, all of those things are really, you know, necessary to get results with herbs. But, you know, herbal medicine is also super approachable. So we don't have to be overly complicated about things like when there's, you know, more simple things. Like, for example, um, if somebody has nausea in their life, ginger is kind of like you can pretty much turn to ginger to address, you know, minor tummy troubles and nausea, you know, and that's pro it's going to work a lot of the time. So there's things like that that do lend themselves to like a quick fix. But anytime there's more of like a specific concern, then you're going to want to work with someone to get the best results. Got it. Okay. So you wouldn't say try to self-teach yourself what to go find in a food store and create your, you're not saying you should turn into an herbalist if you're just interested in accessing them. You probably want to see a registered herbalist. That would be your advice. Well, Adrian, I do want to say that I think everyone should be an herbalist. <laughs> so <laughs> there is that. But, you know, if somebody was just saying, you know, like I have this one issue and I just want to use, you know, I want to use something more natural like herbal medicine to fix it, then working with someone's going to be your best bet. But I think a lot of people like myself, you know, you start using herbs, you start getting curious, you start wanting, you know, to learn more and more. And in that sense, like absolutely everyone can study herbalism. You know, I've gone to over eight years of clinical training for herbs. You don't have to commit to that, but again, we could use more herbalists. So if you find that you want to, great, but it can start with those simple things of just like learning a little bit about this. And I often recommend that people start learning, you know, in the very beginning, they could learn about one herb. And oftentimes people, there is something out there that just kind of like has piqued their interest and they're curious about, could be something like garlic or turmeric, which is really popular. Maybe it's something that's growing in their garden, but just something they'd like to learn about. And you could just start there and get to know that one herb. Cause as we've discussed, there's so many things to know about an herb, you know, not just like a list of what it's good for, but also, you know, like how do you make herbal remedies with that herb? Is it best as a tea? Is it best taken as a powder in a capsule or do you make an alcohol extract out of it? So there's, there's so many ways of knowing plants and getting to know plants. So I both, you know, all are recommended, but when somebody comes to me and says, I have insomnia, what herb do I take? I know that that person's probably going to be disappointed. You know, if they go to their browser and type in like what herb is good for insomnia and they just start randomly taking herbs, they're probably not going to get great results. I, I would hope that they do. I don't mean to be a naysayer, but it's, it's going to be unlikely. So in that situation, when you have a particular ailment and you want help with that ailment, I think it is helpful to work with a practitioner. So um, I'll just share some of my different experiences with herbs, both from, you know, figuring things out on my own and then working with practitioners. Like you said, uh, you can use herbs for some mild discomfort. So I do turn to ginger for any sort of, you know, menstrual cramps or any kind of nausea. I had a very bad burn on my back from actually a heating pad and this summer and turned to, you know, one of my favorite Chinese herbal salves that I ordered just on Amazon. Uh, but I used to live in China, I lived there three different times from age 16 to 23. So I knew from, you know, my host family and, and other Chinese people in my life, the power of some of these things. And they're quite inexpensive, honestly, compared to um, some other 
drugstore burn creams and um, without any side effects, you know, there's just, it's just purely natural. So um, that worked wonders. I was using it every single day and it was just amazing how much the scar went away and, you know, just, just really impressive. And then when I was healing from chronic Lyme disease, when I was uh, a teenager or a tween, I guess I was (laughs) diagnosed when I was 11 and kind of rid of it when I was 13 or in remission. And uh, my mother found a Chinese herbalist in uh, Flushing. I grew up in New York City and we would travel out uh, routinely. You know, he would sort of evaluate me and put together these custom uh, formulas like you were talking about based on uh, both Lyme disease and just me as a patient. And I took these in the form of horrible smelling teas. I mean, horrible. (laughs) I've been there. I know that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And horrible tasting. Whoa. So bitter. Um, Luckily, I think things have changed since then. And like you said, a lot of these things are put into extracts. So into alcohol, and you can just put some drops of that in water and, you know, swig it down that way. And it's a little bit easier Um, or in capsule form at the time, you know, the teas were the way to go. You know, I'd be 12 years old. My whole house would stink of these teas and I'd be having play dates and my friends are going, you know, what is, what is that? And why do you have to drink it? And looking back is kind of funny, but you know, at the time I was like, oh, this is brutal. Um, But I have to say it was one of a handful of therapies that I used um, because antibiotics uh, were no longer effective once I, you know, found out that I had Lyme. I never saw a uh, tick bite and I put it into remission. So I really credit the herbs that I took in tea form for making my life tough at age 12, but also very effective healing therapy. And I've since interviewed for the WellBe Show and podcast, Dr. Bill Rawls, who is a great Lyme disease specialist and who healed himself of Lyme using only herbs. And we've gone through all the different, uh, you know, chronic Lyme treatments that are out there. And really, you know, when you look at effectiveness, cost, and safety herbs are really the best, the best options can take a little bit longer than maybe also uh, using some of these other, you know, treatments that might, you know, speed up the process, but most effective, most economical and uh, safest, you know, chronic Lyme option out there. So extremely powerful. And I know there are other conditions besides Lyme. Can you talk about some of the other conditions that respond best to healing by herbs? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I want to say all of them, (laughs) like all the things, Adrian, all the things. Uh, But one that pops into my head right away is digestive issues. And recently I was just thinking about kind of the insanity of PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors and how detrimental they can be to digestion. And it's kind of like this typical situation where you have you know, a wound or some kind of challenge in your digestive system. And then one of the most recommended things is to take a PPI often long-term, which is detrimental. um, And it does nothing to like actually heal your digestion at all. And in fact, we know it can make things much worse, especially the longer you take it. So let's just talk about like, you get a PPI if you have like heartburn uh, or GERD and sometimes prescribed also with an ulcer. And the idea being that they're thinking that you have excessive hydrochloric acid. And so the PPI comes in and shuts that down. So you no longer have excessive hydrochloric acid. So what an herbalist might think, you know, let's say someone comes with an ulcer and they might think, oh, how can I assist this person and their body in healing that ulcer? So an example might be, you know, it's not like the one herb, but we might use demulcent herbs and vulnerary herbs. And these are herbs that are healing to tissues and that they help stimulate um, the healing of wounds, essentially, because the ulcer is basically a a wound, a digestive wound. And so those herbs can be soothing. They can coat the uh, ulcer so they can bring, you know, immediate pain relief. Uh, but they can also stimulate those tissues to start to regrow and actually heal the ulcer. When you have an ulcer, the tissues can be kind of lax, swollen. And so we can use astringent herbs, which tighten and tone those tissues, again, helping with that healing process. 
So we can use herbs to heal the wound. Um, and really, you know, you're just working with herbs as a way of like stimulating your body's own natural healing um, to help take care of that wound. And then we want to think like a bigger picture, like why did this ulcer happen in the first place? And there's a lot of reasons for that, um, that, you know, could be looked at, but let's just take like the most standard or obvious and common um, of just like the poor digestive health. We can be using herbs to help strengthen and tone the digestive system. Of course, we definitely want to be looking at diet and making sure that the person, the way they're eating is really working for them. But herbs can be a really big part of this too. For example, a favorite tradition in herbalism is taking bitters. And bitters are referring to this whole classification of herbs that have a bitter taste. And that bitter taste actually stimulates all sorts of wonderful actions in the digestive system. In some ways we see it as like challenging the digestive system. So it's, you know, kind of help propelling things along. Like the idea being, if you just ate white potatoes day in and day out, that would be hard on your digestive system. It'd be hard nutritionally, um, but hard on your digestive system. And you're just eating like this one, you know, starchy substance all the time. Um, and you wouldn't be challenging your digestive system in any way. It's kind of like similar. We think of like movement, you know, if you just like took a 20 minute walk on flat ground every single day, nothing wrong with that, of course, but if that's like the only movement you did every day, then, you know, you would never be like challenging your muscles and um, your flexibility, your strength, et cetera. So kind of same deal with bitters. Bitters go in, uh, as soon as you have a bitter flavor on your tongue, you start to salivate, which creates this whole cascade of digestive events. Of course, your saliva be important for breaking down carbohydrates. Uh, and then that actually increases a healthy amount of hydrochloric acid in your stomach. It helps release the pancreatic enzymes. Bitter taste also stimulates the production and release of bile, which helps digest fats. So in this case, you know, what we're really doing is we're not just saying like, oh, somebody has not assuming that someone has an excessive hydrochloric acid and we're not simply taking something to like turn off that acid and thereby just, you know, the so-called band-aid solution. Instead, we're saying like, how can we help that ulcer to heal? So that's taken care of. And then how can we create a better environment in that digestive system that's more resilient um, that can help, you know, stop this ulcer from happening in the future as well. That's so interesting. So as you were describing that, I had this very simplistic question, but I, as a follow-up, what is the main difference between taking a pharmaceutical for a chronic health issue and taking herbs for a chronic health issue? So you used an ulcer, for example, and I was talking about chronic Lyme, but there are so many of them out there. What is the main difference? Well, I mean, you know, just to be like a somewhat overly simplistic comparison between the two is that Western medicine pharmaceuticals are often used to suppress a symptom. It's kind of this heavy handed approach of like the body is doing this thing. And so I'm going to, you know, lay down the law and make it do this other thing by taking this, you know, pharmaceutical and the pharmaceuticals are rarely healing in nature right? They aren't like, if you take something for high blood pressure, you aren't actually getting to the reason of why you have high blood pressure. Or if you have insomnia and you take a benzodiazepine, that's not addressing why you have insomnia. It's just this like super heavy handed approach. Whereas with herbalism, you really like, as an herbalist, I'm always thinking, you know, what is the body doing now? What is the body trying to do? Um, you know, how can we turn to herbs to assist in that healing process? So there's a lot more trust that our bodies are ultimately the healers and also that our body is striving towards wellness. And so what we're here to do is reach out to herbs and kind of get a little assistance, right? Sometimes we need an assistance. I think about, you know, with my own autoimmune disease, I was told there's no cure. You, you know, take prednisone, prednisone is not a cure. It's just stopping inflammation from happening and um, kind of controlling the immune system a bit. So it's not a cure eventually, like I'm going to continue down this road and, you know, end up dead at the age of 40. That's what they told me. Whereas when I took herbs, it's saying like, you know, what is going on in the body for me? I think it was intestinal permeability. That's my guess. I didn't have a biopsy, but that's my guess. And I think all of those things I did helped to like heal the situation that was going on. And so, you know, six months later, I didn't have symptoms and I haven't had symptoms yet because that situation was healed. 
which isn't to say that like, I, you know, wouldn't want to be overly simplistic or make like miracle cure promises, you know, not every disease out there can be magically cured by herbs, but it, there is a lot of healing that can happen with herbs um, and really getting at that you know, core situation or core problem. I also just want to feel like I, I should, you know, give the caveat that like, you know, because herbalism, it works within a holistic sense um, system, like functional medicine. It's not just the things that we swallow. That's going to make a difference in our health. It's not just about swallowing herbs instead of swallowing drugs. Right. It, there's all those other things that go along with it. Like, I don't know, I was thinking of a client that I had who had insomnia and she had been taking benzodiazepines and through our work together, we started talking about things more and she was weaning off the benzodiazepines. And then like, basically it came down to the fact that she hated her job. She had a horrible boss who made unrealistic demands of her. And it was ultimately like, you know, quitting that job and getting, you know, a better job for her that solved her insomnia. <laughs> so it's not, you know, like, it's just the, the things that we take, but it is looking at it within this much bigger perspective of our lives. One of the things that I've always explained to people about natural medicine and seen myself, and as I mentioned with my Lyme experience, it wasn't like the only thing I did to heal was take herbs. Herbs were part of uh, a system that I was, you know, or a protocol that involved changing my diet and taking certain supplements for micronutrient deficiencies and, you know, moving my body and these other things. Or if you, you know, had a major trauma, maybe, you know, you needed to release that and take herbs to heal something, or it's usually a combination. And the same way that herbs work as holistic medicine, herbs are part of a holistic approach. And you can't just take an Advil, put it aside and change, you know, change over to this herb and expect that um, that's going to solve everything. Sometimes you have to look at all the things that might be contributing to that chronic illness or that chronic symptom. Um, but one thing that I love about herbs that I wanted to mention that I learned from Dr. Rawls is that when it comes to killing microbes, right, and a lot of our chronic diseases come from microbes come from um, bad bacteria, fungus, viruses, parasites, things like that, that are in our gut, um, that have somehow taken more control than our good bacteria. Therefore, our immune system isn't able to conquer them. And that's certainly what happens with Lyme and a lot of other infections. Antibiotics go in and wipe out the bad bacteria, but they also wipe out all of the good bacteria, which is essentially your army, your protectors, your defense people. So when the dust settles, the bad can grow back easily because there's no good to, you know, protect you. With herbs, and I, I'm hoping you'll take this from me and explain it much further, but my understanding is that it can be very effective for killing off infections and microbes because the herbs know to target the bad microbe, um, but not touch the other good cells, which is the major difference between antibiotics and herbs. And that's what makes them so powerful. Now they're more gentle. So it takes a little bit longer maybe, which is why if you were dying in the hospital, you might, you know, antibiotics would be the right tool to use at that time. But for these longer term chronic infections, herbs are such a wonderful tool. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, how they target these bad microbes and the differences between kind of like the antibiotic approach? Yeah, that's a good question. And one that I think we're continually trying to understand, how do herbs work? We don't really know all the time how herbs work. We just see the results. Um, but in terms of, you know, what you're saying, you know, one thing that herbs can do is they can like inhibit quorum sensing. And so they can break up biofilms, which are a difficult thing to address. And so they go in there and they disrupt these biofilms from happening, which can, you know, make bacteria more susceptible to being, you know, taken care of and removed from the body. So they can do interesting things like that. Um, and we know that, you know, through the studies of them and seeing, you know, how that happens, um, like in Petri dishes and that sort of thing. The other thing that herbs can do is they can address tissue states, which I was kind of talking about with the ulcer. Um, you know, with ulcer, we're looking at the tissue state. We're envisioning this wound that, you know, these lax tissues, these swollen tissues, and especially in the digestive system, 
uh, we can use things to tighten and tone tissues. And so we can make that less easier for bacteria to adhere to cell walls. That's often used for things like um, digestive infections. It's used for urinary infections. They were, were using herbs to help the bacteria, you know, so they don't adhere to those cell walls. So they don't replicate there and instead can be flushed out of the body. And yeah, like you said, it, there aren't herbs that go in and kill everything like an antibiotic. And yes, sometimes, you know, that can be a life-saving thing, but I do wish there was more of this like first approach of looking, you know, what is the tissue state? You know, how can we use herbs to address this particular infection? And, you know, certain herbs are better at addressing one type of bacteria than another. So it can be very helpful to know what exactly you're dealing with. I actually have a story about a bacterial infection that I had a couple years ago. I just suddenly, like, just very quickly, I got this rash on my skin and, you know, it came up super fast. It was gross. It was red. It was hot. It was oozing. And it just it came on so fast that I was just, you know, made an appointment to see my doctor and the doctor, you know, took a look at it. So let's take a culture of it, you know, it might be staff or something like that. So took a culture and the culture came back this, you know, weird bacteria. I don't remember what it was now, but I remember the doctor was even surprised like, Ooh, what is that? Why is that there? And said, unfortunately, this is, you know, a drug resistant bacteria. So, you know, we can try and give you some topical stuff. Just not sure it's going to work though. So gave me a topical thing, started putting it on and put it on as directed, you know, for like five days, nothing changed. I mean, it didn't even touch it. At which point I was kind of like, okay, like, duh, <laughs> I will turn to herbs now. Um, I think just like the severity of it and how quickly it came on just kind of like got me a little bit startled. So I just went this other route. So I started putting herbs on it and within 24 hours, it was reduced by half. And within a week it was gone, you know, and that's like stopping that antibacterial cream and instead using herbs. And it was a, you know, great moment for me, but it was also one of those moments. And this is a moment I've had so many times where I just think, what do people do when they don't have herbs? You know, like what, what would have been that situation? Like they gave me this antibacterial cream. It totally didn't work at all. Would I've been given another cream? Would it then be, you know, would I then be taking systemic antibiotics for this situation that's on, you know, a rash? Anyway, I think about that. What do people do without herbs? And you know, and how did the, how did the herbs work in that situation? Well, one thing is that antibiotics, they have this like one mechanism for entering bacteria and then killing bacteria. And the way that things become antibiotic resistance is that the bacteria develop ways to avoid that, you know, like they, they're evolving and they don't like being killed. So they, you know, evolve to not be killed by these simplistic antibiotics. And that's why more and more antibiotics are being created is because they need like different ways to kill the bacteria. With plants, they're so complex and they work in so many different ways that it's not as easy to just like, there's no like one door that the bacteria can shut to keep out herbs. Herbs have all these different mechanisms for acting against them. As an example, there's something in plants, uh, berberine containing plants like Oregon grape root, which is Mahonia uh, or golden seal, which is a sensitive plant that needs to be used sparingly. Hydrastis canadensis is the name for that. They have this mechanism where antibacterial resistant cells have this pump in them. And so they basically like antibiotics enter the cell and there's this pump that just then sends the antibiotics out the cell and no harm done to the bacteria. These berberine containing plants actually actually break that pump in a ways. I mean, I think that's a very simplistic way to describe it, but essentially that's what's happening. They're not letting that happen. So, and those plants themselves are not necessarily antibiotics, right? They don't kill everything. They're not systemic in nature, but they can be used to help, you know, in some situations could be used to help make antibiotics more workable because they're breaking that um, pump system. And then another, I think even a more brilliant way that herbs can be used in the so-called like antibiotic situation is that they can stimulate our immune system. So, I mean, our immune system is just amazing. It is so incredible what our immune system does. I mean, without it, obviously we wouldn't make it long. So that is really our like number one source of, you know, avoiding these infections. So herbs can come in and they can help stimulate. Sometimes it's not even as simple as like stimulating something. Like it's not just like putting, 
your foot on the gas of your immune system, but they do something that's called modulate the immune system, um, which means that, you know, if you gave these immune modulators to 20 different people, it's not like they're going to have the exact same course of action with each of those people. Um, those herbs and often mushrooms are immunomodulators. They're going to interact with that person's immune system and they might, you know, decrease excessive activity, which is why they're often used for things like seasonal allergies and then increase beneficial activities, you know, like increasing um, phagocytosis, for example. So there's just so many ways that they um, can, you know, work where again, addressing tissue states. So helping things not adhere to cell walls, uh, stopping biofilm production or quorum sensing. And, um, you know, they could be directly antimicrobial that, uh, that works as well. Uh, they might be assisting, you know, like decreasing the bacteria's effectiveness. So, so many ways that they can be used as antibiotics, but yeah, you have to think about them differently. It's not, you know, like it's not as simple as just taking an antibiotic pill once a day. Um, but luckily it also doesn't have, as you said, those negative consequences of wiping out all bacteria. I mean, I think anybody listening to that description is like, all right, sign me up. I want to have some on hand for the next, you know, thing I get so that maybe I can avoid taking antibiotics or even applying an antibiotic, you know, cream or something like that. So I have some sort of logistical questions about accessing herbs, because I still think it's so foreign from most people's thought process when any sort of ailment comes up, both acute, you know, they hurt themselves uh, falling down the stairs or chronic. And they, they, you know, they want to address something, but they just say, go to the doctor. Right. And, and the, the herbs are not going to be in the doctor's uh, tool belt. So it doesn't come up. And so they really have to understand how to access them to do so. So first of all, I know you talked about uh, teas, uh, capsule or supplement forms, tinctures, um, topical bombs or solves. Um, what are the best delivery methods and are any more effective than others or is it just preference? Yeah, it's kind of like all of them are have their time and place and that could depend on the herb. Sometimes an herb is better, you know, it might be a stronger way to have it is an alcohol extract, uh, but sometimes it's stronger as a tea. Um, so the herb can play a role in like what the best way it is to work with that herb. Another thing that can play a difference in like, is how is that, you know, like, what are you experiencing? So like, for example, if somebody had just like, this is kind of a silly example, but if someone had a fungal infection, I wouldn't be recommending a syrup made with lots of sugar. Or if someone had a sore throat, I wouldn't be like, take these capsules. <laughs> I would want something, you know, like a throat spray that goes directly on the throat or a tea that goes directly on the throat. So it's kind of, all of it is, you know, it changes how you take the herbs change according to the herb and according to the situation it could be a, according to the person too. You mentioned, you know, if you're drinking the Chinese teas that tasted horrible, I did that. I've done that too. It can be pretty bad. And so it can be hard to talk someone into doing that, you know, to drink this like horribly tasted, lots of liquid that tastes very bad. That's not always an easy easy way to go. Sometimes it's just truly best to do that way um, because you're getting in like lots of herbs. Like if you remember, you know, making those teas, it was often probably like a handful or two of herbs that went into that. Oh yeah. It was a very thick consistency. Like a normal tea is not thick at all, right? It's pretty yeah, much it's cooked water. down for a long yeah. time. But yeah, it was very much like thicker than hot chocolate almost. Mmm, so yummy. <laughs> <laughs> chocolate so healing, yummy. Right? We're so grateful because it is so, yes, so grateful. So <laughs> disgusting. But yeah, so taking a tincture, it's often easier, but it's not always like the best way because with a tincture, in order to get like that much herb in that big of a dosage, you would have to take ounces of alcohol, which of course is not something that's generally recommended. So it really, it depends on like how much the dose is for that herb. And so what's the best of preparation according to the dosage. So yeah, there's also, a lot. I was um, thinking about my brother's kids. They don't want to consume anything that doesn't taste good, but he's, he'll like dump some capsules of herbs into their smoothie and they can't mm -hmm. tell. So there's yeah. like little things yeah. like that where, you know, sometimes uh, a certain type is better than other. And, and then obviously a solve or a topical, you know, if it's topical, that's, how you'd want to do it. You don't want to swallow tiger bomb or like a burn right. cream. You want to put it on the burn, right, obviously. Right. So, okay. Another question for you on kind of 
logistics and access. How does somebody tell herbal quality? Is it organic versus not organic? Are there other certifications or things to look for? Are any herbs at risk of being, you know, heavily sprayed with chemicals or containing mold or anything like that? Yeah, there's a lot to consider when it comes to sourcing herbs. And potency, of course, depends on all sorts of things. And one of the best ways is to know the herbs. And so when you taste them organoleptically or smell them, that you're able to say like, yeah, this is good stuff. Um, that might sound, I don't know, complicated, but if you think about like, you know, lettuce fresh from the garden versus like iceberg lettuce at the, well, let's say tomatoes, right? It's like, you know, tomato fresh from the garden versus like a tomato in December in the Northern climates that tastes like cardboard. It's not like that difficult to tell when you know, you know, if an herb is a high quality or not. So it's good to know that. And that's one thing with like caps buying capsules. If you can't see, smell, taste that herb very well, then it's going to be tough to know, you know, is this high quality? And when it comes to adulteration and poor quality herbs, capsules are the most common way that, you know, those are going to happen because it's easy to hide them. Um, you know, if you're looking at like, if you're buying a bulk herb of chamomile and you're looking at those beautiful dried flowers, you know, you can tell that that, that is chamomile, you can smell it, you can see it and you can say, this is good stuff. But if it, you know, when things are in capsules, it's much more difficult to find that out. Certifications can matter, um, especially if herbs are coming from overseas, because anytime there's a certification like organic or fair trade or fair wild, which is an important one, um, if there's a certification, then those herbs are tracked all the way from the source um, through the whole process. They're tested along the way. They have to meet certain requirements um, versus no certification you know, you don't, sometimes herbs across the globe will trade hands 15 times. And so you just don't even know like what happened to them along the way. And a friend of mine, Dr. Ann Armbrecht, she just wrote a book called the business of botanicals, looking at this. And that book just like blew my mind. Like I just had no idea. She actually traveled the world and looked at herbs from the source through the supply chain, you know, to our kitchens basically. And what she saw, you know, is basically like you absolutely want to have organic certification, um, and you definitely want fair trade certification because the way that people are treated makes a big difference, not only ethically in their own lives, but also when you're paying someone well and treating them with respect, they are in turn, you know, investing their lives and getting good quality herbs. She talked about all sorts of things that she saw along the way of, you know, like people reusing old cement bags to harvest their herbs into and that cement getting, you know, mixed in with the herbs. That is not uncommon. Um, so it's, it's important to think about it. Cause as we said before, herbs aren't standardized. And so how they are grown, how they're harvested, how they're processed, all of that plays a role in their potency. And so you, you want to do as best as you can to make sure that all of those steps were taken along the way. Of course, you know, that's like thinking globally, cause a lot of our herbs like turmeric or cinnamon come um, from overseas, but whenever we can get herbs more direct from the source, that's great. And there's actually a lot of herbal farms in North America where you can get herbs directly from the source if you're doing bulk herbs, or there's, you know, it's about choosing trusted uh, companies that are doing a lot for not only ensuring that their herbs are high quality, but are establishing relationships with people at the source. And so, you know, oh, of whole course, now you have to tell me what some of your favorite herbal companies are, because I'm sure that will be a question people have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, for buying bulk herbs and teas, Mountain Rose Herbs is one of my favorites. They're an online apothecary and they do so much, you know, proactive things, supporting small farmers. Um, they have a really rigorous testing, um, looking at, you know, making sure that the herbs that they're selling are high quality, they have great prices and everything, you know, is organic and fair trade and fair wild in some situations. There's great tea companies out there that are doing a really excellent job. Like traditional medicinals is a good one. That's very popular and Puka, P-U-K-K-A. That's another great one that's doing, um, you know, proactive things to make sure they have the best herbs and they're treating everyone in the process um, with respect and giving them a living wage. So, um, yeah, those are a handful of ones. Uh, yeah, I was going to say Puka and traditional medicinal are basically two of the three tea brands that I drink. And uh, I want to just mention very quickly that 
if somebody listening to this doesn't have a chronic health issue that they would go see a registered herbalist for or some sort of acute burn or nausea, um, drinking herbal teas, especially some of the, you know, things like uh, milk thistle, which is so supportive to the liver or, uh, you know, some of these will have like the function on the front, right? Digestive aid, this and that. It's just the most amazing way to kind of like drink medicine all day and hydrate. And it keeps you from drinking like some other kind of, you know, flavored seltzer, like whatever the heck you might drink otherwise. Um, But I've seen so much great research, which I'm sure you've seen as well about one specifically uh, men that in China, it was a Chinese study that drank three or more cups a day of tea at significantly lower rates of like heart disease and other cardiovascular issues. And it's just, you're drinking medicine all day. It's just, it's so easy compared to um, then having a chronic health issue and having to maybe take these more intense herbs um, that will, you know, target and heal. Um, so I just, I just tell that to everybody and Puka and traditional uh, medicinals are two fantastic brands. And I have heard of mountain rose herbs as well. So I'm glad that you like them. Okay. So those are some great recommendations. Since we are in the time of COVID, can you talk a little bit about some popular natural antivirals that people can have on hand should they contract COVID and um, also how you would take those, whether it's tea or capsule form? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with antivirals, you know, viruses are interesting. We, we, talk, we talked about bacteria. Bacteria have this cell wall that can be invaded and, um, and they can be disrupted in that way. But viruses don't have cell walls and they replicate by attaching to our own cells and uh, replicating in that way. So antivirals, you know, this idea of like, sometimes I think people think like, oh, antibiotics kill bacteria, antivirals kill viruses. Um, but it's not quite that way because we can't just like kill all of our cells, right? That have been invaded. So it's a little bit more complex, I guess, in a way. The first way that I think of antivirals is as we talked about immunomodulators. So immunomodulators are herbs that we take to help bolster our immune system. And again, it's not just about simply stimulating the immune system, but it's about them having this complex relationship with our immune system that helps to kind of challenge and stimulate it in a way that makes it overall more resilient. And that I feel like right now in the time of COVID, but you know, before I used to talk about this, like basically like the cold and flu season, uh, but certainly now with COVID, like I think it's a great idea for all of us to be taking immunomodulators every day. Why not? Um, why not be strengthening our immune system the best that we can? So does that like just make sense to me? Um, some of my favorite immunomodulators are things like um, mushrooms, and I take like a blend of mushrooms almost every day from fungi perfecti, uh, but lots of those things like uh, reishi, uh, turkey tail, lots of good ones in there. Another favorite is a Chinese herb, one of my very favorite Chinese herbs, which is astragalus root. And astragalus root is this is a sweet root. It can be taken every day. It has so many gifts to it and is a wonderful immunomodulator. One of my favorite combinations is actually astragalus and reishi together. And what I like to do is combine those two and then add spices like uh, ginger and cinnamon and cardamom and make those up into a spiced tea. And that's one of my favorite things. We drink that all winter long. It's delicious. And it, you know, you're taking these amazing herbs like astragalus and reishi that have so many benefits, even before, you know, even beyond immunomodulation. When you say you take them, you mentioned a tea that you made, but are you mostly taking them in tea form? Um, it depends with astragalus and reishi, the, well, especially astragalus, the dosage is pretty high. You could go anywhere from 10 grams to 30 grams, which in capsules, we're talking like 20 to 60 capsules a day not fun. It's expensive plus like just not fun. Right. Um, so in that situation, I'm using the bulk herbs, um, because you can like, you know, use a handful of bulk herbs and make it into a tea and then drink the tea It's better than drinking or taking 60 capsules. I drink a lot of teas. Like you said, there's so many benefits to teas, but you know, you can take them in, in different ways. So I think astragalus and reishi that hadn't had, when I say tea too, you want to decoct them is the term, which basically means to simmer them. Uh, for an extended period of time, you know, one or two hours even. 
one thing I like to do is put them in a crock pot overnight or, you know, put them in an instant pot and let them cook a long time like that. So you don't have to be like at the cook stove, you know, for a couple hours monitoring your tea. Um, So that's a way to do that. Um, So for my lazy listeners or my, you know, time strapped new moms or whatever, are there mm -hmm. any that you would take in like capsule form or just like a tincture that would be kind of fast um, that you might purchase? Yeah, the fungi perfecti, they have a lot of great mushroom blends and those can be taken in capsules. So that can be an easy way to do that. Okay, great. I just wanted to give something to the people yeah. who are willing to do the work and for the yeah. people who are not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so one more question for you. I can't believe how much time we have left. Um, we're coming up on the end here, but I have a couple more because it's just so interesting to me. Mm-hmm. So this is just for antivirals in general, but let's say you somebody came to you or somebody came to the hospital, they were confirmed COVID positive. If there was a concoction of antiviral herbs that you might prescribe as a registered herbalist, if they were working with you, how might those be adjusted to account for maybe some other things about them that make them unique? Or, you know, how does like custom blending work? What would you change out about somebody that has lupus? You know, would you basically what's, what's that process of deciding what a custom blend looks like? Well, just kind of to continue on with like the viral standpoint. So we have immunomodulators, which we can, you know, use now to keep ourselves healthy. If we get sick, then we can use herbs that inhibit viral replication. And so, you know, that's basically like the virus comes in, it gets into our cells, they start replicating. There's herbs that actually stop that replication process, which then allows our immune system to have more of an upper hand and not be like, you know, being taken advantage of by these, by the virus. So uh, an example of that is elderberry and elderberry is one that herbalists love to take at the onset of a cold or flu. It's, it has created a lot of interest for COVID, but at this point we don't have any, you know, human clinical trials looking at COVID-19 and botanicals. There are, you know, some that are being recommended and some studies that are in the works, we're still kind of waiting on that. But we do know that elderberry is an amazing herb for all sorts of other coronaviruses, um, cold and flu. And so in that way, you know, we can, we can say like, maybe it'll work, you know, for COVID, why not? Time will tell, but that, you know, stopping that viral replication can be really important. So that's kind of like the onset of an illness. We have that ability to, that's like kind of when is a great time to like ramp up herbal medicine at the onset of an illness. Cause you have the chance, like, I can't tell you how many times I felt scratchy throat, felt I was coming down with something and then take an elderberry and had those symptoms go away. So that's, it's loved for that. It's famous for that. Lots of human clinical trials, looking at that, also looking at it from a prevention standpoint. So um, yeah, elderberry is loved for that. But then once the illness settles in, we start having symptoms, right? So we might have um, a cough, a fever, aches and pains, those sort of things. And in that situation, we can start using herbs, um, which a friend of mine, Jim McDonald's calls these indirect antivirals in the sense that we're going to be using herbs for a viral infection. We're not necessarily killing the virus, but we can be assisting our body um, to help, you know, build strength and, um, and work against the virus. And so like, let's just take coughs real quick. People have probably experienced a cough in their life. And if you've had a cough, you probably had several and you know, not all coughs are the same. Sometimes you have a dry spasmodic cough where you just like can't stop coughing. I often get those at like the end of an illness. Um, Like I'll lay down to bed at night thinking like, okay, finally I'm going to rest. And then like, I just start coughing this dry spasmodic cough, can't stop it. Um, So there's that type of cough. Then there's like coughs where our chests are so congested, right? We have like all this mucus in our chest and we cough and it might be feel tight to breathe because there's just so much going on in our lungs. So we have a congested cough in herbs, like with herbalism, we don't use the same herbs. Like there's no herbs for coughs, right? Instead, we're thinking like, what's going on with this body? So in this situation, like, let's say that dry spasmodic cough, well, there's dryness, right? We know like this dryness is super irritating and it's causing this reflexive action of coughing, um, which is so painful. And so if we just stop the cough, which is what over-counter medicines will do, right? They'll just like stop the cough, um, which gives you symptomatic relief, which, you know, can be very soothing and needed at times. 
but it doesn't address the dryness, right? So we can use herbs that actually bring moisture specifically to our respiratory system and help address that dryness. They aren't necessarily, you know, there to stop the cough, but what they're saying is like, oh, we're going to help soothe these tissues. So there isn't that irritation. So the coughing doesn't need to happen anymore. So the customization that you're talking about is more around the actual symptoms and what people are experiencing than just like their health profile. It sounds like. No, that's a really great question, Adrian. In this acute situation, we're mostly concerned with the acute symptoms. So when you, you know, like, I often tell people, it's like, we're not like getting on this like philosophical train of like, who is this person and what is their life? You know, like when they have a dry, irritating cough or a congested cough, we're thinking like, all right, let's address that symptom and get them relief. And so we personalize based on the symptoms. But when we're thinking about chronic health, or simply maintaining good health. Uh, in herbal medicine, many systems of herbal medicine from a traditional perspective use a constitutional model. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's like, I've kind of been like dancing around that of like, how is Western medicine different from herbs? It's this constitutional model that often plays a big role. And with that, we're, the constitutional model is looking, it kind of sounds strange, but it's something that we have all experienced. And it's looking at these four qualities of hot and cold and damp and dry. And those are like the very basics of them. But I know we've all experienced this, like maybe you are someone who is naturally warmer than other people around you. And you'll notice like, I'm in a t-shirt when other people are wearing a sweater and, you know, I rarely feel cold or the opposite. Someone's feeling like, you know, I'm always got my sweater on, you know, even in the summer, and, you know, I often feel like it's hard to get warmed up or, you know, my hands are constantly cold. That, that's kind of this like very simplistic view, but this opening view into where like looking at how we are different constitutionally and same with dryness and dampness. You know, some people are like, oh, you know, my skin is constantly dry. No matter what lotion I put on, it's never, you know, restoring to a natural balance, um, et cetera. So we're looking at these different qualities of hot and cold and damp and dry. And that gives us a really good perspective or constitutional model about who that person is. And then we choose herbs based on that. And that's one way that when people try to use like herbs for such and such condition, that it can be difficult for them. So for example, if two people have digestive problems and they look up, you know, what herb is good for digestion and they find out that ginger is great for digestion, which we know it generally is. Well, ginger, if you've had the experience of having ginger tea or ginger in a meal, or just a little bite of ginger, you know, it's spicy, right? It's very warming. And if somebody already has a lot of heat in their body and their digestive complaints are actually related to heat, uh, then having that ginger is probably not going to be a very good match for them. Um, you know, they're looking for why, uh, my Chinese herbalist used to look at my tongue mm -hmm. before you know, when I would come in for each uh, new formula, he would check out my tongue and see, I, I, I assume these different constitutional aspects. Yeah, that's exactly right? it. Yeah. Yeah. Like the color of your tongue, the shape of your tongue, the coating of your tongue. That's like one way. Like I gave the example of like, how does the person feel? That's one way looking at the tongue, checking the pulse, um, hearing more symptoms that generally affect that person. Each one of those is like, taken into the full account. There's not just like the one thing you do, um, but it's really like, how does all of this inform who this person is and what they might need? I think that's one of the most brilliant things about herbalism. Obviously it's not the simplest because it does take time to learn. And there are more, you know, sophisticated symptoms like Chinese medicine. You often go to school for eight years to learn um, all these different constitutional patterns and um, so it can be take time, but I think that we all know on some level, these things like, and it can really be as simple as like, you know, it's a hot summer's day. You got, you know, sweat dripping down your back and you're feeling super parched and maybe your skin feels flushed. Like, are you thinking in that moment? Like, oh, what I really want is the thick cup of hot cocoa or, you know, a steaming bowl of chili. Like, that's what I really want right now. <laughs> like, no, right. We're thinking like, where's the watermelon? Where can I get the lemonade? 
you know, how can I cool off and, you know, vice versa in the middle of winter, you're freezing cold, you've been out skiing, you know, you're can't really feel your fingers kind of thing. You're not thinking like, you know, Oh, I'm so cold inside. I can't wait to have some ice cream. (laughs) Well, maybe, but, (laughs) but really, you know, you're, you're more thinking of that, like hot cup of tea and that warming soup. So that's like, in essence, what we're talking about. I know we have an experience of that within ourselves of everyday experience, And these constitutional uh, models are just looking at deeper and deeper manifestations of that uh, throughout our whole body. So that deeper look does take a little bit more time, but I think, you know, we are the best experts for our bodies. And when we start to pay attention to that, uh, we can really get a lot of insight. Got it. Okay. So I've got two more questions for you and then I promise I'll let you go. Mm -hmm. Um, The first is you mentioned, you know, Chinese herbalists, for example, go to school for eight years, which last time I checked, that's the same or longer as a medical doctor. So that's quite a bit of training. You have gone to school for, you've, it sounds like eight years of clinical training, which is super extensive. So what is the difference between if somebody wanted to see a registered herbalist, which you are, which is an RH, right? Is mm-hmm. there some sort of database where they can look up and find one nearby? Um, is there, you know, major differences between a trained uh, Chinese herbalist? Or, and, and I'm not just saying a Chinese person, but somebody trained in Chinese herbology, for example, or Ayurvedic herbology or Western herbology. Um, I know there are some differences, but is there sort of an overlying accreditation today, or do they all receive the same amount of clinical training? Or um, Mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about those differences? Yeah, that is kind of a gray area within the herbal world. Uh, Within Chinese medicine, there's, you know, Chinese medicine schools that are often, you know, acupuncture and herbalism, and they have their own certification and uh, process. And so that's often separate from a Western herbalism And the registered herbalist that comes from the American Herbalist Guild, and they have, what they do is, you know, they're basically, um, the application process is you're showing them that you have this minimum amount of uh, study that they put forth, you know, like so many hours of materia medica, so many hours of pathology, et cetera. Um, And then you also have to have, you know, so many hours of actual clinical work too. Um, in order to get that certification. So, you know, that's kind of those distinction between those two. There are herbalists too, who practice, who don't have the registered herbalist certification. And kind of like we talked about, there's like, oh, somebody is having a little bit of digestive problems and they can use some help or they want to know how to use herbs for colds and flu. Um, And that can be, you know, you don't need to have you know, thousands of hours of clinical training to be able to do those things. Like those everyday health ailments can often, you know, have a more simplistic approach. But when you start to get into things like Lyme, that, you know, not only needs a clinical herbalist who has extensive experience, but oftentimes, especially with Lyme, somebody who's then focused their clinical time, their experience on that particular disease, because it is so vastly complex. So And how would somebody search for that? Like, oh yeah. So the American Herbalist Guild, their website, which I'm pretty sure is AmericanHerbalistGuild.com, they have a listing of their practitioners. And so you can search, you know, most people do long distance uh, consultations, even before COVID, that was a thing. Um, But now, especially with COVID, that's a thing. And you, so you can look for people all over, you can look for their qualifications, their, you know, what they specialize in. Uh, but it's also listed, I believe, you know, by location. So you can find, you know, if you're looking for someone who might be in your neighborhood, so to speak, you might be able to find that as well. Okay. That's so super helpful. All right. My last question for you, and this one is broad, so don't feel like you need to, you could probably write up your third book on this topic, but herbalism is so powerful and it's really the original medicine, right? Used by every different civilization, for thousands of thousands of years, Western medicine is a fetus or an embryo in the (laughs) scheme of medicine, right? It's like a hundred years old and has nothing on the length and therefore the wisdom of um, herbalism, whether that's in India, China, Native Americans, South Americans, like 
pretty every every civilization besides uh, Europeans and even, you know, Europeans pre Western medicine um, had their own, you know, herbal methodologies. So what needs to happen for herbalism to become more mainstream, i.e., you know, prescribed as a form of medicine by a conventional doctor when you go in for nausea or sold in a mainstream drugstore like a CVS? Or do you think herbalism should stay separate from Western medicine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I definitely believe and this, you know, is my both experienced and biased opinion that it would be so much better for people if herbs were more of a first approach before more invasive or, you know, methods were used or things, you know, that had more serious side effects. So I definitely believe that there's a place, you know, most people could benefit from herbal medicine at some point in their lives in terms of like, you know, how would it happen for it to get more mainstream? There's a, you know, or be prescribed by Western medicine. You know, one thing that we haven't yet talked about is that herbalism also offers us an opportunity to recognize that we are a part of nature and a part of this earth. And we just cannot separate ourselves from it. In Western medicine, you know, they do like to separate us from things. So I always say when you take a plant, whether you take it by eating it or you take it in herbal form, your body recognizes it because you're both part of the same natural world. Mm -hmm. um, you're both cells and water and whatever versus mm -hmm. a pharmaceutical has been created by human beings and therefore is synthetic, right? So your body doesn't recognize it, which is why it induces side effects often because your body is reacting in a strange way. Whereas your body's like, oh, hello, old friend, plant herb. Like we are part of the same mold, which I just think is, you know, it sounds a little hippy dippy, but I think it's a cool way to think about it. I love how you said that. And the recognition of, um, you know, things like seasons matter and weather matters. I mean, you know, you'll commonly hear someone says like, oh, I can feel the weather changing because my arthritis picks up or something, you know, it's like, we are living, breathing beings as a part of this greater ecosystem of the earth. Like I just imagine like going to a clinic and sitting down, you know, with someone in a white coat in this room that has four white walls and they, you know, listen to my list of symptoms and they like prescribe an herb for it. Or probably what's more likely is a constituents based on, you know, taken extracted from an herb. We're really missing out on a lot that herbalism has to offer in that situation. And um, so I think that, you know, that connection to nature, recognizing um, that we're all part of this, looking at things like you mentioned, you know, when you went and saw the person who was helping you with Lyme, your formula changed, you know, that's another thing of just like, there's not this like static thing. It's not one herb for everybody, but this, you know, complex mi mixture that's always changing. I say that all the time, like nothing in nature is static. We are not static. Um, everything is always changing. Think about the weather, weather you know, like the, does the weather just stay the same all the time? No, um, nothing in nature does. So I think, you know, there's this kind of, this, there's a greater philosophy that I don't think, you know, it's going to take a long time before Western medicine is adopting this greater philosophy of natural health. So that's kind of one thing. Another thing is um, herbal demand, you know, the, just in the past year with COVID, we actually saw a huge demand on herbs. Um, people turning to that as an answer. And we've also seen herbalism grow in popularity even in the past two decades. And the thing is like herbs are not a, they're a renewable resource, but there's a limited amount of resource. And so we have to, you know, as herbalism grows in popularity and as more people turn to herbs, we need to be thinking about that. How are we growing and harvesting herbs sustainably? you know, the, the soils that the herbs are in really matter. Some would even argue that to grow herbs like in rows, you know, as a mono um, crop would, is not as great as like them growing in a meadow with all sorts of other plants around them, which makes it really hard to harvest them, which increases the price. So there's anyway, there's just supply issues we need to think about um, as that grows, because with herbalism too, it, you know, we we get to see directly that the health of my environment, the health of the plants directly affects my health, right? If the plants aren't um, resilient, if they're not potent, then that's going to affect my health. And then of course, I mean, this is kind of same with food, right? We can, if we're eating like so-called healthy food, but it's grown, you know, in these huge farms that are sprayed with all sorts of stuff where workers are sick, the soil is sick, 
even if it's like a tomato, which is supposedly healthy, like we're not going to benefit a lot from that. So we have to think about that with herbs right. too. A non-organic tomato is not the same as an organic tomato, which, uh, no. or, and the same is definitely true with all plants, including herbal plants. So we're probably, what you're saying is we're probably not going to see herbs in, you know, qu high quality herbs in a CVS or something anytime soon. But that's actually the magic of the time that we're in uh, with the internet, you know, uh, things are so much more accessible just because your local drugstore doesn't have X, Y, or Z. If you're an empowered person and patient, you can start to do this stuff on your own and, and access these high quality herbs from companies that, you know, someone like you would use um, as you know, a person that just wants to take some antivirals to make sure that COVID, you know, doesn't have much of an effect on them should they get it or something like that. So I think, you know, the modern world is very toxic and very sad in that way because our sources, herbs or plant, you know, food or whatever, um, are really compromised. And as you said, as demand grows, it gets more compromised but also there's greater access. So that's good. Um, yeah, so it's important to just be, you know, informed as somebody who buys herbs, you know, where, and to think about it, you know, like where did these herbs come from? How were they treated? How were the people treated? All of those things really, they really do matter. Awesome. Well, Rosalie, thank you much, so much. I could stay on here for three more hours with you. I have so many questions. Um, and obviously, buying both or, you know, one of your books uh, is something I have to do because I clearly want to go deeper into this uh, for my own knowledge. But I hope that, you know, people buy your books and keep, go deeper and become herbalists themselves and uh, access uh, registered herbalists for any kind of chronic health issues or symptoms as they come up and stock their medicine cabinet uh, with things that can, you know, become part of their daily tools for both prevention and, you know, everyday little ailments that might come up or an acute thing like a wound or something, um, because they're so powerful. Um, and I think relatively inexpensive, um, and, uh, really, you know, as I just said, accessible in a way that they probably weren't 30 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, even. So thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. It was so great to have you. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. It's a really fun conversation for me. So thanks for having me, Adrian. Of course. All right. Thanks, everyone.